In 1993, German engineer Rudolf Gattenbrink was inside the Great Pyramid of Giza studying an unexplored shaft in the Queen's Chamber. What's interesting about this shaft is that unlike the two shafts found in the King's Chamber, they don't open up to the outside. Instead, they seemingly go about 10 feet into the wall and lead to a dead end, meaning the purpose of them was still unknown. So Rudolf created a little robot that was equipped with a camera and a light small enough to fit inside of this 8 inch wide square shaft. And when they sent this robot into the tunnel, something happened that would change his life forever. Once the robot reached what was supposed to be the end of this shaft, they noticed that it kept going. But rather than continuing in a straight line, it actually ramped up at a 40 degree angle into a much longer, previously undiscovered section. And from the camera's feed, they could see that it went for another 90 yards before coming to a dead end, where the robot came up to what appeared to be a tiny limestone door with two copper handles embedded into it. This discovery baffled Rudolph and his team because metal has never been found anywhere else inside the Great Pyramid, which which is supposed to be made entirely of limestone. And they could tell this was a door of some sort because it had a little bit of space around the edges indicating there was likely something behind it. Was this door placed there after the pyramid was built or was it intentionally put there to protect something? Either way, Rudolph had to know what was behind that door. That's when he asked Zahi Hawass, the Minister of Antiquities for the Egyptian government, for permission to investigate further and see what was behind the door. We work two years. No, no longer. Uh, no, no longer, no. Why not? But rather than giving him permission, Zahi, along with the Egyptian authorities, shut down Rudolf and his team and banned them from ever researching the site again. There were quite a lot of problems between us about the question how to state the find. Now, we've actually met Zahi before in my video about the Sphinx. And the truth is, Zahi, despite being the most famous archaeologist in Egypt, has a known history of suppressing any new evidence that may conflict with mainstream Egyptology. When I do archaeology, you listen to me. Shut up. But what you need to realize is that the vast majority of mainstream Egyptology is based on ideas that are highly speculative at best, especially when it comes to the Great Pyramid. Because almost everything you've ever learned in school about it are not proven facts, but rather are unproven hypotheses based on circumstantial evidence and perpetuated by Zahi at the top of the mainstream Egyptology pyramid. See what I did there? Now, according to mainstream scientists, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built about 4,500 years ago by the Pharaoh Khufu who wanted to use it as his tomb one day. It allegedly only took 20 years to complete. And by the time it was finished, the pyramid actually looked much different than it does today because it was covered in a white, smooth limestone that went all the way up from the base to the capstone, which was made of solid gold. That is, until somewhere in the 1200s, a huge earthquake hit Egypt, causing most of the buildings in Cairo to collapse, along with some of these white limestones to break loose. Unfortunately for us, the Egyptians at the time decided to then strip off the rest of the white limestone along with the capstone so they could be used to help rebuild the city, leaving the blocky appearance that it has today. But here's where things start to get murky. Mainstream Egyptologists will point to what looks to be a sarcophagus located in the uppermost room known as the King's Chamber as hard proof that it had to have once been the resting place of the Pharaoh Khufu. But what most people don't realize is that no mummy of anyone, let alone Khufu, has ever been found in the Great Pyramid. In fact, no mummies have been found in any pyramid. Another key to the mainstream hypothesis that this was once Khufu's tomb is that Khufu's name was found written multiple times on the inside wall of the Great Pyramid. But unlike most hieroglyphs that are usually carved directly into the stone, these inscriptions were literally just red paint or graffiti that someone painted on the walls potentially long after the pyramid was built. Now, I'm no Egyptologist, but if someone tags the side of a building and says Patrick James was here, does that automatically mean that I built the building? In fact, when it comes to the topic of hieroglyphs, no hieroglyphs of any kind have ever been found carved into any wall inside of the Great Pyramid, meaning that whoever built it didn't feel the need to put them there. And to take it a step further, no hieroglyphs specifically mentioning who built the pyramids, let alone how they did it, have ever been found anywhere in Egypt. To this day, the only legitimate reference to Khufu we've even found is this small statue, which may or may not actually be Khufu, and was found nowhere near the Great Pyramid. Once again, showing that these mainstream theories about the Great Pyramid of Giza are nothing more than a weak hypothesis at best. Because when you take a second to really admire the sheer size of this monument, it really starts to make you question everything you've ever been taught about ancient history. Here's why. The Great Pyramid itself is made up of 2.3 million large limestone blocks, with the stones ranging in size from 2 tons all the way up to 80 tons. And despite looking quite small from a distance, when up close to these limestone blocks, you realize how massive they actually are. Many of these stones were taken directly out of the bedrock from the Giza Plateau, but some of the larger ones that make up the intricate interior, weighing up to 80 tons, were somehow transported from a town 500 miles south of Giza. Kind of crazy to think 
think about because even if the mainstream Egyptologists are correct that the pyramid was built 4,500 years ago, it would still predate the invention of the wheel by roughly 300 years. Now, I'm not one to doubt the creativity of man, especially the ancient Egyptians, but in a day and age where we have airplanes, skyscrapers, and invisible internet waves delivering feet pics to people across the globe in an instant, moving an 80-ton rock, even with today's technology, is no small feat. See what I did there? For instance, here's an image of a 30-ton construction vehicle attempting and failing to move a large limestone rock. And here's a video showing that even our most powerful hydraulic planes struggle to lift rocks of this size. And those are steel cables, not the bullshit papyrus ropes the ancients supposedly used to drag these stones into place using wooden rollers and wet sand. Now, Egyptologists will tell you that, oh, they could move heavy blocks because they put them on wet sand. Well, maybe if you're just at ground level, that will do. But when you're 350 feet above the ground as you are in the king's chamber, that won't do at all. I'm just going to make an educated guess and say that wooden rollers would stand zero chance of being placed under 80 tons of anything, which leads me to the cuts on these stones. Every stone making up the pyramid was not glued into place using concrete or mortar or anything like you'd expect. In reality, each side was cut so precisely and placed so delicately that the joints between every stone making up the pyramid fit so perfectly together like Legos that you can't even fit a razor blade between them. Meaning that this structure has literally withstood the test of time using nothing but its own weight and precision made cuts. Something you can't necessarily say for any of the 100 plus pyramids built by copycat pyramid builders for over 700 years after the Great Pyramid. So how did the Egyptians cut each stone so perfectly? According to mainstream Egyptology, they use copper hand saws and chisels. And just to show you how utterly unrealistic this is, not long ago, one Egyptologist attempted to recreate the stone of the Sphinx using copper chisels, much like the ones the ancient Egyptians might have used. And after several days of hammering away at this stone nonstop, he barely made a dent in it. After days of work, their copper chisels and stone pounders are barely making a dent. Not only was the copper chisel not chipping away at the limestone very efficiently, but the chisel itself would become utterly useless after a few dozen strikes. When Roger tries chisels made from bronze, the results are disappointing. As you can see, we're just we're leaving a lot of metal and very little stone is flaking up. Eventually, the dude gave up on the chisels altogether and finished the project using a power saw. And since we're on the topic of saws, a completely different group of researchers created a large hand saw that was made of copper, much like the ancients would have used. And after several days of sawing back and forth with the combined efforts of multiple people, they could only cut the stone at a rate of about four millimeters per hour. Dennis, will we see any progress in our lifetime? Yes, if you came back in an hour time, you would see about a four millimeter cut down into the stone. An alarmingly slow rate that doesn't make any sense when you closely examine some of the cuts made on these ancient stone blocks. As you can see here, we achieved this in just a few days. For example, this sarcophagus at a museum in Cairo was said to have been discarded in ancient times because on the bottom of it, there's a cut that's about three feet long that was just ever so slightly off center. So they abandoned it and tried again with a new piece. Here's why this doesn't make any sense. If they used copper saws to cut these stones, it's safe to assume they probably would have realized they were off center long before getting three feet into the cut. Heck, even if they could cut four inches per hour, they would have still had time to correct the mistake which tells me that whatever tool the ancient Egyptians used to cut these stones had to have been operating at a much faster rate. That, or they had the incompetent stoner Egyptian working on that one. Rock on, dude! And with all that being said, even if we accept that the pyramid was nothing more than a fancy tomb built with copper tools, how can we explain the fact that it only took them 20 years to build it? The math simply doesn't add up. Because let's say you were able to cut, transport, and place 10 stones a day. That means that to place 2.3 million stones, it would take you roughly 600 years. Years. And this is assuming you don't make any mistakes along the way and keep continuously placing stones 24-7, 365 until it's done. And to do this in just 20 years, they would have to place 315 stones every day without ever taking a break using just ropes, pulleys, and ramps. And just to show you how utterly unrealistic this timeline is, here's some food for thought. The pyramids of Teotihuacan, Mexico, equally as impressive but nowhere near as large in size, took 150 years to complete. The Sydney Opera House took 14 years. 
The Panama Canal took 33 years. And this clay quarry in France that was a massive hole roughly the same size as the Great Pyramid was contracted to be completely filled with dirt. And it took dump trucks dumping dirt into it like an assembly line every minute of every day, 12 full years to finish the job. So to tell me the ancient Egyptians precisely cut large 80 ton limestones, somehow transported them 500 miles, delicately constructing the pyramid piece by piece so perfectly you can't even fit a dollar bill between the stones in just 20 years time does not make any sense whatsoever. Now, I'm not doubting their ability to build a pyramid. Maybe they could. I'm just doubting their ability to do it with the tools they had as quickly as they supposedly did, especially when you consider how it was designed. From the slope angles to the dimensions to the global positioning of the Great Pyramid itself, nothing was done haphazardly. In the 1940s, British airman and archaeologist P. Groves was flying over the Great Pyramid when he noticed something odd. As he flew over the monument, he saw that the pyramid had what appeared to be eight distinct sides, not four like it normally appears from the ground. And upon further examination, he found that these eight sides were only visible at sunrise and sunset on the equinox, which only happens twice a year when the sun is directly above the Earth's equator. This would officially be the first time this phenomenon was documented in modern history, leading many to believe that maybe there's more to this structure than meets the eye. Was this design done intentionally? And if so, why was it only meant to be seen from the air when the airplane wasn't invented for another 4,400 years? Buckle up because here's where things get crazy. When you look at the exact location of the Great Pyramid, you'll find that it actually sits at the geodesic center of all landmass on planet Earth. Meaning that if you drew imaginary lines out of the side of the Great Pyramid that went all the way around the globe, those lines would touch more land than it would if the pyramid had been built at any other point on the planet. And that's not all. The Great Pyramid is also perfectly aligned to magnetic true north with an accuracy of 360ths of one degree of latitude and longitude. That's an accuracy of 99.94%. In fact, it's so closely aligned to true north that we couldn't even tell how accurate it was until the invention of the modern day satellite. And to this day, it's still the most accurately aligned structure on the entire planet. For comparison, the Paris Observatory was built to be aligned to true north, but even with modern day technology, they could only get it to within 6 sixtieths of one degree, making the Great Pyramid twice as accurate. Now keep in mind that the ancient Egyptians were only supposed to have a basic understanding of math, probably no more complex than high school algebra, meaning they were supposed to be completely clueless about things like geometry and trigonometry. And they certainly wouldn't have known about mathematical constants like pi or phi, which were discovered thousands of years after the Great Pyramid was built. Yet both of these constants are seamlessly weaved into the structure's design. For example, pi is the ratio that explains the relationship relationship of a circle's circumference to its radius. And if you made an imaginary circle that circumference was the same length as the perimeter of the Great Pyramid, the radius of that circle would equal the exact height of the Great Pyramid. And phi, known today as the golden ratio or Fibonacci sequence because it's responsible for the formation of life itself from the human embryo all the way up to the formation of galaxies. Well, if you took the surface area of all four sides of the Great Pyramid and divided it by the surface area of the base, that gives you the number 1.618 or the golden ratio itself. And if your mind's not already spinning, if you look at the exact coordinates of where the pyramid is on a map, you'll get the number 29.9792458 degrees north. Ironically, this number is the exact same number as the speed of light when measured in meters per second, which is kind of crazy because the speed of light wasn't discovered until the 1600s. Surely these couldn't all be a coincidence, right? Let's keep going. This pyramid I have in the background of my videos is actually a close representation of what the pyramid is built like. The Great pyramid itself sits on a base called the sockle. This is kind of what the sockle might look like where you got the pyramid sitting on an actual platform like this. Now, this sockle is actually found to be so flat for the Great Pyramid that using lasers, we can measure that it's flat to within one quarter of an inch, a level of precision that we could only reproduce today if we use the very lasers we use to see how flat this thing actually is. In its heyday, the sockle was actually perfectly flush with the white limestone that used to line the walls of the pyramid. But because those white limestones are no longer there, this actually gives us two different ways to measure the base of the pyramid. One measurement with the sockle and one measurement without it. Now, to fully appreciate what I'm about to tell you, we have to first discuss something that I know all my flat earthers out there are going to hate, the actual shape of the earth. What you've got to understand is that the earth is actually not a perfect sphere because when it spins on its axis, the centrifugal force causes the earth to bulge out at the equator, meaning the shape of the earth is actually wider than it is tall. I didn't say flat. I did not say flat. In other words, 
words, if you took one square minute of latitude and longitude, the rectangle that's formed by this square minute is actually not a perfect square because the latitude or north south line is actually slightly shorter than the longitude or east west line. So how does this relate to the Great Pyramid? Well, if you took one square minute of latitude and longitude and split it into four equal parts, the length of the latitude line would equal 3022.940 feet and the longitude line would equal 3043.547 feet. Now, if you measure the perimeter of the pyramid without the socle, aka the shorter measurement, you'd get the exact same number of feet as the shorter latitude line to within four decimal points. And the same goes for the perimeter with the socle, which would give you the exact same distance as the longer longitude line with the same level of accuracy. So what does this even mean? It means that the pyramid itself is a scale model of planet Earth at the ratio of one to 43,200, meaning that if you were to make the pyramid 43,200 times bigger than it is, it would exactly equal the size of the northern hemisphere of the planet and it would be accurate to within 300 feet. Now here's why this is absolutely bonkers. 300 feet is as accurate as you could possibly get because the earth has constantly shifting and moving forces that are randomly acting on the surface of it at any given point in time. There are various tidal forces working on the earth which are constantly causing it to distort its shape by up to two or three or four or 500 feet. So we never would be able to get more accurate than three or 400 feet because the earth itself is changing shape. And if we were to measure it every year for the next 10 years, we would get 10 different numbers. And as it turns out, this number 43,200 is actually not random at all, nor is it a coincidence. Remember how I mentioned earlier that the eight sides of the Great Pyramid are only visible on the equinox? Well, if you calculated the number of seconds in a day from sunrise to sunset, that number would be exactly 43,200 seconds. Seriously, do the math. Meaning that every one 43,200th of a day, or exactly two seconds, the Earth rotates a distance that is exactly equal to the perimeter of the base of the Great Pyramid. And that's not all. The radius of the sun is 432,000 miles. The Earth wobbles on its axis exactly one degree every 72 years, a multiple of 432. And the inner chambers of the Great Pyramid have a resonant frequency that's in sync with the natural vibrations of the Earth. This resonant frequency is 432 hertz. So as you can see, whoever constructed it had an advanced understanding of math, astronomy, and Earth geophysical properties seamlessly incorporating this knowledge into every minute detail of the Great Pyramid itself. Leading to the question, why? Well, that answer could possibly come from taking a closer look at the inside chambers of the Great Pyramid. In 1994, a man named Robert Baval released his book called The Orion Mystery, where he outlined his theory that the three pyramids of the Giza Plateau may actually have a deeply rooted connection to the Orion constellation, more specifically, the three stars that make up Orion's belt. He points to the fact that when viewed from above, the size of the three pyramids, along with their positions relative to each other, are an exact mirror image of Orion's belt. Additionally, when you look out of the southern shaft of the King's Chamber on the equinox, the shaft points directly towards the belt of Orion, but not in present day. This only occurs if you wind back the skies exactly 4,500 years right around the time when the Great Pyramid was built. Ironically, this same phenomenon is found across the globe in the pyramids of Teotihuacan, Mexico, where the layout of these Mayan pyramids from an aerial view closely resembles both Orion's belt and the Great Pyramids of Giza. And when you take all of this into consideration, along with the unanswered questions regarding how the pyramids were built and Khufu's highly speculative connection to it, you have to ask yourself, if the Great Pyramid of Giza wasn't a tomb, then what the heck was it? Because whoever built both of these sites across the globe in ancient times clearly were influenced by the same information. One insight into this question may lie in the research of an electronics engineer and inventor, Joe Parr, who started studying the electrical, magnetic, and radioactive properties of the Great Pyramid from 1977 to 1987. Joe believed that given the shape of the pyramid and the inherent electromagnetic properties of the limestone and quartz that it was made of, the pyramid itself might might have a detectable energy field around it. The only problem is that if one existed, it likely wasn't strong enough today to have any inherent function. That's why one day he built a smaller scale model of the pyramid in order to do an experiment where he would send an alternating magnetic current through it to try to strengthen this field. And when he did, something very interesting happened. The pyramid started to form an energy bubble around it that was essentially a force field blocking out any external forms of radiation, including gamma rays. Intrigued, Parr then decided to take the experiment 
one step further, this time by placing a centrifuge inside the center of it and spinning it at a very high rate to try to amplify the strength of this bubble. And when he did, once the bubble fully formed, the pyramid started to become weightless and levitate. Now here's where the experiment took a mind-bending turn. The orb of energy eventually became so strong that while levitating, the pyramid itself seemed to phase shift out of sight altogether before then reappearing embedded into the walls of the room where this experiment was happening. A result that led Parr to believe that given the right conditions, structures with a pyramid shape had the ability to enter what he called hyperspace, allowing it to pass through physical objects. And over the course of these experiments, Parr also made note of the fact that the time of year specifically seemed to have a direct effect on the strength of the bubble that was formed, being strongest around mid-December, or more specifically, December 12th through 16th. Something he found had to do with the natural flow of charged particles coming out of the sun that the Earth would naturally pass through as it orbited around the sun. Ironically, it's exactly during those dates that the Earth, the sun, and Orion's belt form a perfectly straight line, a finding that Parr documented in his research at least seven years before Robert Bavall's book, The Orion Mystery, ever came out. So what does all of this mean? Well, it's hard to say. Before Joe would pass away in the early 2000s, he believed that the Great Pyramid might have served as some sort of time machine, given its inherent ability to channel energy and tap into neighboring dimensions. An interesting idea since string theory, which is a relatively new field of science, predicts the existence of at least 10 dimensions. So it seems that Parr's time machine hypothesis is just that, a hypothesis that's largely speculative, much like many of the mainstream ideas around the pyramid, until we have a much better understanding of quantum mechanics. And given everything we've discussed so far, from the insane construction methods, to the sacred geometry, to the archaeoastronomy encoded directly into the architecture of the Great Pyramid, one thing is certain, until these gatekeepers stop suppressing any evidence they don't like regarding ancient Egypt, it seems that the more we look into this mysterious structure, the more questions we have. Like, why was it so important to incorporate sacred geometry into the Great Pyramid? And why do so many features of the pyramid align with Orion's belt? And why are some of these features only visible from the sky when manned flight wasn't invented until the 1900s? And given all these mysteries, it's very easy to automatically jump to the conclusion that aliens did it. Aliens must have built the pyramids. But I'm not quite ready to go full tinfoil hat on the pyramids quite yet, because until there's anything specifically extraterrestrial discovered, what I tend to believe is that this is simply proof that ancient civilizations had technology that was far more advanced than we've ever been taught in history class. We're looking at technologies that are not the same as ours. Yes. And that's yes, partly that's why archaeologists can't see them, because they're looking for us in the past. Because the fact is, fossil records show that modern day humans go back at least 200,000 years. And in that 200,000 year time, there's been at least 16 known and documented cataclysms that had the ability to essentially hit the reset button on humanity, sending it back to the Stone Age each time. It's very likely that the entire world experienced a cataclysmic disaster yes. around 11,800, yeah. 12,000 years ago, yeah. and it knocked us back into the Stone Age. With the most recent of these cataclysms being the Younger Dryas impact, when a large asteroid struck Earth, ending the Ice Age almost instantly about 11,500 years ago. Yeah. Those people who were around before that were probably more sophisticated than we are. We yeah. just have a hard time imagining that because yeah. we don't have any evidence of it. And this theory has gained a lot of traction in more recent years, given the discovery of sites like Gobekli Tepe, which dates back to 11,500 years ago, and virtually proves that humans were once far more advanced than we gave them credit for. But it's possible there was a completely different branch of technology, and they had figured out something that allowed them to manipulate enormous stones. Yeah. We just haven't figured it out yet. I mean, take the Sphinx, for example. We've always learned that the Sphinx was built after the Great Pyramid 4,500 years ago. And in 1991, American Egyptologist John Anthony West, who was studying the ground around the Sphinx, discovered that the erosion patterns on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure could not have been formed by wind and sand like Egyptologists have always assumed, but rather could only have formed as a direct result of thousands of years of heavy rainfall. The only problem? The Sahara Desert hasn't experienced rainfall of that nature for at least 11,500 years. And the moment West revealed these findings to the public, Zahi Hawass, Egypt's top Egyptologist, banned West from ever studying the Sphinx again. And I outlined the entire mystery of the Sphinx in this video right here. Go check it out.